Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our 24th session of the Met AI Group Exchange. This week, we have Khaled from Stanford with us to present his research on observational supervision for medical image classification using GAIS data. Khaled is currently a PhD student in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Stanford, co-advised by Daniel Rubin and Chris Ray. His research is on developing more sustainable and reliable ML models for healthcare applications. Thanks, Khaled, for joining us today. So before we start, do you have any preference about how you would like to take questions? Um, yeah, uh, whenever, whenever you want, just interrupt me. All right. So uh, yeah, let's try to make this session uh, as interactive as possible and feel free to ask questions if you have any. Without further ado, let me hand it over to Khaled. All right, thank you, C. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, I'm a PhD student um, co-advised by Daniel and Chris. Um, I also work with Professor Chris Lee Messer in the Department of Child Neurology. Uh, so I work on interdisciplinary applications. Uh, and yeah, that, that's what I love about Stanford. You're, you're, you're able to work uh, in multiple departments. And um, anyways, this, this talk is, is going to be about a new form of supervision, which we term observational supervision. Um, and we specifically focus on medical image classification. And uh, yeah, th this work wouldn't have been possible without my collaborators, um, some of whom are Sarah Nimit, Jupender, Brian Sen, Jared Hong Yang, and my two PIs, Daniel and Chris. Um, yeah, so what are observational signals? So in a nutshell, they're passively collected signals describing human data interactions. Um, so I want you to, to, to imagine, for example, a radiologist going to work and they're, they're tasked with analyzing some data, uh, for example, chest x-rays. Uh, and, and so after they analyze this data, they're going to explicitly log some important findings um, in the form of a, of a report or, or in, a, in a different form. Maybe they're, they're labeling data for machine learning. So they, they label manual labels. But in that explicit logging of information, there's a lot of other things in that interaction between the expert and the data that weren't captured. Um, so uh, basically observational signals are, are those, those additional signals um, that capture that interaction, which may provide additional information that could be useful for machine learning supervision. So an example is eye tracking data. So that radiologist might have looked in a specific location for a longer period of time, uh, and that may provide valuable for us. So eye tracking data, the, the way they analyze the image uh, is one form of observational signal. Another could be mouse traces. So, so a radiologist or uh, an expert might be using their mouse to, to, to go around the image. So we can also log that information uh, or just like interactive actions. So they might zoom in the chest x-ray, they might change the contrast. So all those interactions uh, can also be logged automatically. Um, and another, uh, an another type of signal is click stream. Uh, so, you know, they, they might be analyzing a, a chest x-ray, then they wanna pull up an old chest x-ray or an old report. They might wanna take action on, on um, asking for a, a result, a test uh, to, to, to happen, or look at new test results. So all those actions that they take, like what they're clicking on in, in the system can also be recorded. So the main point is that uh, these, are, these are signals that we're observing from the interactions and they can be passively collected. So without actually interfering with their workflow. And so in this talk, I'm gonna be uh, focusing on eye tracking data. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about why are we ex excited specifically about eye tracking data? Uh, and, and the main message is because gaze patterns contain rich information about the task. So over here on the left is an abnormal chest x-ray. The, the red highlight is a pneumothorax, so it's air trapped between the lung and the chest wall. Um, and on the right, it's a normal chest x-ray. Okay. And, and the green dots are, are locations that the radiologist fixated at. So you can see here on the left where there's an abnormal image, the radiologist kind of finds this abnormal location. They focus their gaze there. 
uh, they might go somewhere else, but they ultimately come back to that location. And so their, their gaze data is very focused in a particular place. Well, the normal one, they're kind of just looking around. They don't find anything that interesting, and it's more uniform. So in this example, you can see that these patterns uh, are indicative about the task at hand. And so there's this rich information. And it's also possible that other than just knowing if, if, if it's abnormal or normal, maybe the patterns are indicative of other things, like if the abnormality is obvious, if it's very big, or if it's very small and hard to detect, they might have different patterns. So um, gaze data has rich information. And also other studies in psychology have shown that, for example, um, it might be indicative of the expertise level uh, of, of, the, of the person. Uh, it might be indicative of like how tired they are, how fatigued they are. Um, so, so that's one of the main reasons we're excited about eye tracking data. And then another main reason is that it can passively be collected at a, at a large scale. So uh, current uh, new, new hardware, uh, there, there's been lots of improvements in the eye tracking hardware. So here's an example uh, of, of a, this is a Toby Pro Nano, and it can just be attached to your laptop. It magnetically attaches. Uh, you just go through a simple calibration step, and then you start your session, and gaze data is being collected in the background. Um, there's also more sophisticated eye trackers that can be permanently, uh, permanently attached to, to desktops uh, and, and lots of other options. Um, if your work isn't uh, on a desktop or a computer, uh, there's these eye tracking glasses as well. But also, we believe there's this AR boom coming this, with wearables. So uh, specifically in hospitals, uh, AR technology is improving. Um, I believe lots of people are going to be wearing uh, the, these, these AR glasses or, or whatever they look like in the future, um, and, and particularly in hospitals. So this is interesting because it's not only going to uh, allow us to collect eye tracking data, it's also going to change the way we interact with the data itself. And as a part of these wearables, they come with eye tracking capability. So. Uh, we believe in the future, there's going to be a lot of eye tracking data. And so it's interesting to ask, how can we utilize it uh, to, to supervise machine learning models? Um, and, and that's what we're going to be looking into at this talk. So I just want to kind of frame how we, we think about observational supervision as compared to other uh, supervision techniques. So in this spectrum on the left, uh, there is no domain knowledge at all. So this is like unsupervised uh, learning, things like figuring out subgroups or classes via clustering. And then on the right side of the spectrum, uh, it's explicit domain knowledge. So, so the, the, uh, the expert gives us manual labels. Uh, and then in between is like forms of weak supervision. Uh, one of them being like programmatic labels like snorkel, where a user has to explicitly give us these labeling functions. Um, we see observational supervision as even a weaker form of that, uh, where we don't have to ask anything of the expert. We're just collecting gaze data from them. And we know that the gaze data does include some domain knowledge. So uh, it's just a visual of, of how we view observational supervision. And so two problem settings we're going to consider is, can we use gaze data as a weak signal for recovering task labels? And then can we use it as a weak signal to recover uh, subgroup labels or additional information? Um, specifically, the challenges are, first, how, how should we summarize the gaze data to supervise machine learning models? Um, it's not clear how to do this. In the rough form, form it's just a sequence of locations. And then the second challenge is, if we don't have any task labels, uh, can we use the gaze data to recover task labels and then uh, supervise image classification models? And then the third challenge is, if we do have task labels and we have gaze data, can the gaze data provide additional information to improve the performance of, of machine learning models? So in order to, to uh, go after these challenges, uh, we first we equipped uh, radiologist tools with eye tracking capability. Uh, so we collaborated with Stanford radiologists. Uh, 
uh, so we, we use this open source uh, tool uh, from Daniel's lab called ePad, um, and we integrated the, the eye tracker with it. So uh, the radiologist would just have to press a button to, to start recording. Uh, and then they, they, they do their session, they label the data, and we're collecting the eye tracking in the background. And so we did this um, on two new data sets. So CXRP, which is trying to detect pneumothorax from chest x-rays. We got 951 chest x-rays with gaze data. Um, and then we also collected brain MRI, which is uh, we tried to detect tumors from brain MRI slices. This was on 2,794 slices with gaze data. And then the middle one, which is CXRA, this was a public data set that came out around a year ago. It also has around 1,000 chest x-rays. And the task here was just to detect whether the x-ray was normal or abnormal. And these are our three uh, medical data sets we consider. So first solution to how do we summarize gaze data for supervision is we surveyed lots of different gaze features, and we found that there were four key features that were good at describing scanning behaviors that were related to the task. So the first one was how long the radiologist spent on the image. The second one was how long they spent in a specific location. Uh, the third one was how many different locations they visited. And the fourth one was how diffused those different locations were across the image. Um, yeah, and uh, we found that these four gaze features across our data sets exhibited uh, different distributions, class conditional distributions. So for example, if we looked at the time spent for normal versus abnormal, uh, the, the expected value and the distribution was shifted, indicating uh, that, that there's information about the task embedded in these uh, gaze features. Uh, just the, the takeaway here. And so to, to dive deeper into how um, gaze features relate to the task, uh, we try to model the, the, the gaze data itself, mathematically model it. Um, and we did this using ideas from neuroscience. Uh, so the way we envisioned this is you have a chest x-ray and your radiologist looking at it. Uh, you really, you have an internal reward map where you collect rewards when you find an abnormal patch. And you wanna keep looking around the image until you collect a certain amount of rewards. And, and, and then you, you, you kind of figure out what the diagnosis should be and then you go to the next image. So it's like a it's like reward-based search. Um, and there's this internal reward map. And so the probability to look at a location is gonna be the soft max between these rewards. So, um, so, so we, we assume that there's a higher reward in abnormal regions. So if there's an abnormal patch, there's a higher reward and, and therefore there's a higher fixation probability. So we, th th these are the assumptions we made mathematically. And then we use these equations to kind of relate the gaze features to task related information. So for our four gaze features, we looked at the expected value and we found out that they're a function of two things. They're a function of the abnormal sparsity. So uh, this is like information about the abnormality itself. How big is that abnormality? And then we also found them to be a function of this attention gap, the ratio of A to B. And attention gap, the way I, I like to think of, of it intuitively is, it's like how, how much of an expert, uh, how attentive the radiologist is. If they're very attentive to the abnormal locations, the attention gap is gonna be higher. Um, so, so we kind of went through this process and, and, and to, to validate uh, that, that indeed these gaze features uh, are, are very related to the task at hand. So the second challenge we have is now we have these gaze features, okay? We know they're related to the task. How do we extract the task labels? Um, so we go through this process. Uh, it's a fairly simple process. The first uh, step is we extract those key gaze features for all the images. Uh, the second process is we use our validation set where we have some of those task labels and we estimate the class conditional distributions. So what's the probability of the gaze feature given the class label? And then for our train set, we take those class conditional distributions, we, we use a base theorem, and, and therefore we're able to estimate what's the probability of the label given the gaze feature. 
Um, so we do this uh, for all the images in our train set. We train our models uh, with those weak labels. And we found, we found that across our three medical tasks that we were able to train um, models with only gaze data that come within five AURC points to models trained with the actual manual labels. Um, and, and also we, we did the scaling analysis where we increased the number of training samples and, and we verified that the more gaze data you have, the better the model's performance is gonna be, or like the more weak labels that we have. So um, and this was encouraging because uh, it says like, if you're in a setting where you can collect gaze data at large scale, that's when it can be particularly helpful. And the, the third solution for our third problem, the third problem was if we do have task labels and we have gaze data, how can we use that gaze data to improve the model's performance? So our method was a simple multitask learning uh, workflow where uh, we use a shared encoder and then one classification head is trying to predict the task label and the second classification head is trying to predict the gaze feature. So think of this as like the model, the, enco the encoded features must have information about whether there's an abnormality. And then it also needs to predict, like, for example, how long a radiologist spent on the image. And so the, the, the hypothesis is that this is going to, the multitask learning framework is going to act as an inductive transfer mechanism and, and transfer the information, the gaze features into the encoder and hopefully improve the overall performance of the model. So th this was our method and we found that uh, gaze MTL improves the performance by up to 2.4 AURC points across our three tasks, which indicates to us that gaze data indeed contains complementary information to these task labels. Um, okay, so this is all I have now for what we've done. And now I'm going to move on to what we're currently working on. Um, but yeah, please let me know if you, if you have any questions on, on what I've presented so far. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, please. Could you go to the slide where you show like um, you estimate the, the, yeah, the condition of probability. I think one slide before this. Um, yeah, the, uh, this, this slide. Uh, before this slide. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, okay, the, the modeling, yeah. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit confused about this. Um, so is the internal reward map um, like 1551 one here, is it, how, how is it defined? Is it based on, yeah, is it defined yeah. using domain knowledge or? Like, yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, no, we, we, we don't assume we know what the internal reward map is. Um, and, and, and any of our methods, but when we're just analyzing uh, how the gaze features relate to the abnormal, uh, to, 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 to the task related information, like we're just trying to do that analysis. And so we're, we're just imagining that it's set up in this way where there is some internal reward, reward map in the expert's head that we, we don't have access to, right? Uh, but we assume that it exists and we assume that where there is ground truth abnormalities, there's a higher reward in those regions. Um, and we just use that kind of assumption to, uh, to, to kind of mathematically ground the connection between gaze features and, uh, uh, you know, task information. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. So Khaled, I have one quick question for the yeah for your solution too. Can you go to the next slide uh, once? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, actually. So I, I don't understand this part that when you are comparing the supervised versus the gaze WS. Uh huh. So um, your supervisor actually was trained with the actual uh, ground truth annotation, right? Correct. And your gaze model was just trained like at the training phase. The gaze model was just trained with the gaze data. Uh, yeah, the weak labels we got from the gaze data. That's right. Okay, so it's just binary, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all three examples are binary classification. Okay, so for example, like chest texture, we have like 14 level, but you didn't use that. It's just binary. 
because I would imagine for case like different abnormality, like positioning would be very different. So I was just curious, like what what's your actual guess data annotation? Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. So the, the ones we collected, uh, uh, are you talking about like uh, I guess yeah. So over here in the CXR. Yeah. Um, it actually, you're right. It actually is like there are 14 different abnormalities, mm -hmm. uh, and we just grouped that into one abnormality for this experiment. Um, oh, okay. And okay. and then all, and then there also exist normal images that don't have any abnormalities, and that was the other label. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, you, you bring up a good point that like, um, is gaze data kind of is there enough variance in the gaze data to detect exactly. differences between? So I was yeah, I was mainly um, curious because you are showing like a high concentration on the abnormality of the gaze data, but mm -hmm. um, imagine that uh, it. I think it should be different based on different abnormality. For example, mm -hmm. if you have an enlarged heart, probably that the. Uh, the, the area that covers the gaze probably would be higher than a lung mass, right? Which is a very small mm -hmm. region. So I don't know, like, um, if you see any these kind of patterns for the gaze data itself. Yeah, yeah, I uh, yeah, that's a great insight, and I would expect that as well. Um, yeah, I, uh, that's something that that we should definitely try. Uh, that, okay. That's a great insight. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. We we I, I think it'll be straightforward to just try that and. Uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see if we can actually detect differences between subclasses. Um, and for metastatic classification, you are just analyzing this performance based on slides, right? Not for the whole volume. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, for, yeah, so we, we definitely uh, divide the, the train and the test like, like on uh, patient level, so there isn't like the same patient, but uh, the task is uh, per slice or per okay. slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to move on to some problems we're currently like working on, interested in, and yeah, I'd love anyone's ideas or, or if you're also interested in working on these, please reach out. I know lots of, uh, lots of people are working on them as well. So like, can gaze data also help us mitigate the subgroup robustness problem? And I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. Can gaze data provide information, not just beyond the task labels, but beyond other modalities like text reports? Um, and then also what other observational signals can provide these useful, uh, super, super, as, be a useful supervision source? Um, so yeah, um, I think uh, lots of people are familiar with this problem, but there are these hidden stratifications or, or hidden kind of subgroups uh, that cause model failures or model uh, like underperforms a lot in these subgroups. Uh, so here I just have two, two quick examples. So uh, uh, they found that the model was actually in, in melanoma recognition, model was actually paying attention to these uh, skin markings, surgical skin markings, uh, instead of the actual uh, important area. And, uh, and, and they found that when, when they, they, the, the performance dropped significantly when those skin markings uh, were not present anymore, which is a very important subgroup. Um, another one is uh, pneumonia detection uh, relying on, on these uh, laterality markers. Um, and, and so um, there are also lots of other examples in, our, in the pneumothorax data set that we have. Uh, we found these other hidden stratifications. For example, uh, there's a correlation with the pneumothorax and the chest tubes because chest tubes are used to treat the pneumothorax. So uh, when we remove chest tubes from the examples with pneumothorax, the model performance dropped significantly. Um, or, or when the pneumothorax was more difficult to detect because it was smaller, the performance also dropped. Um, if, if we... Um, added pleural effusion uh, to, to examples with no pneumothorax, the performance also dropped because the model got confused, thought it was a pneumothorax. Uh, we saw something similar with enlarged heart. So uh, th these examples are everywhere. And, and I think it's a really important problem. Um, and so something else we were also working on is uh, this, this evaluation framework where uh, how can we compare different methods for subgroup robustness? And so this was something something we're currently working on, which is uh, 
so, so, so picture a data set that comes with metadata, okay? We can create these settings where there's going to be degraded performance on subgroups by undersampling the data set to, to kind of inject these correlations. Um, and so uh, this creates like a framework where we can create at a large scale these settings where there's a degradation in performance by, by explicitly making correlations, like semi-synthetically making correlations in the data set. And so this was joint work with, um, with lots of folks here, but there's something we're currently working on, which is a kind of uh, ha having a, a, a lot of different settings with subgroup uh, degradation. And we're interested in, can gaze data provide uh, additional information uh, about these subgroups, which maybe either help us detect the subgroups so that we do something about it, or um, just improve the model to 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 be better at, uh, at performing in those subgroups. Um, so that's one direction we're working on. Um, another direction is so like there was this really cool data set that was just released less than a month ago uh, by Lanfredi et al. and uh, they have over 3,000 chest x-rays from five radiologists and they have gaze data. They have, with the gaze data, synchronized dictated reports. So they have the timestamps that synchronize with the timestamps of the gaze data of what the radiologist is actually saying. Um, they have multi-class labels and ellipses localizing uh, the abnormalities and then also bounding boxes uh, around the hearts and the lungs. So uh, I I'd be really interested to see like, Okay, so we have a text report, we have class labels. Uh, can the gaze data now provide even further information beyond what's in the text reports already? Uh, I think that'd be really cool. And so uh, this is a great data set to test such ideas on. And then also just investigating other observational signals. So um, as I mentioned before, there's the clickstream data that Nandita is currently leading right now. Um, can we use kind of the actions that radiologists take uh, in, in the AHR system uh, and, and, uh, and kind of integrate that to model supervision. And ultimately something like kind of very futuristic is if we have these brain signals like EEG data, it's like, it's basically capturing in a noisy way like everything you're thinking about. <laughs> okay, and it's like, we're observing those brain signals. Can we use those brain signals to supervise machine learning models on the task you're currently performing. I mean, it might, might be a bit crazy, but I think it'd be really cool to try out. But um, yeah, so, so these, these different observational signals will be cool to investigate. Uh, um, yeah, but thank you so much. Uh, that's all I had um, for today. Uh, please get in touch uh, if you wanted to, to uh, kind of collaborate or, or have any questions. Um, we also released our code and data sets on GitHub, so uh, please visit those links. If you want to find out more about our paper, uh, we'll link the, our recent Mackay paper describing uh, these methods in more detail. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. I'm happy to take more questions. Thank you so much, Khalid, for the excellent um, talk on your observational work and uh, the future steps. So yeah. Is, does anyone have any questions? Um, so yeah, maybe let me ask a question first. Um, could you go to the slide where we show like the domino uh, framework? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, would you mind like explain in more details about like uh, how this, uh, how this works? Yeah, 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 sure. I kind of went over this a bit quickly, but um, so so essentially, um, one one kind of drawback on kind of this whole uh, field on subgroup robustness is that there isn't really a benchmark where we can test um, if we're doing well. Uh, on improving subgroup robustness across many different settings. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually like papers usually like focus on like a specific task uh, that they knew about beforehand. They knew this was a problem. And so then they come up with a method and then they show like uh, subgroup performance improved, you know, but how do we know that that wasn't 
you know, that, that's going to work on many different settings. Um, so, so this is like a benchmark kind of evaluation. Oops, sorry. This was like a benchmark evaluation framework where um, we have our, we, we ha think of a data set that comes with metadata. For example, we have images uh, and we know that uh, we know subclasses, like we, we know, like think of mimic. Uh, we, we have the 14 different classes and, and, and we also know if there are support devices uh, in the images. Uh, so what we can do now using that, that extra like metadata is that uh, we can correlate the, the, the support devices with a specific abnormality. And so, and we do that correlation by subsampling so that, uh, the, so that that correlation exists. And so now when there's the correlation, you train a model, the model relies on, for example, support devices. And so now we have control over creating these settings. And, and so using just that simple kind of framework, we, we can scale up like on different metadata, uh, different correlation strengths. And so we did this and, and, and we created over a thousand settings where there, were, there was degraded performance on these subgroups. Um, so yeah, that, that's the domino. We, we, um, yeah, we will be releasing more information about it soon. But yeah, that's something we're currently working on. Okay, so so in this diagram, like alpha is basically the the, the value that you control the correlation. Is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Like higher value, uh, higher alpha means we're gonna subsample like a lot. So there's like a very large correlation, like a ninety percent of, let's say, chest X-rays with pneumothorax have a, ch a chest tube. So uh, it it kind of uh, controls the strength of the correlation, uh, and then like. A1 and A2 are the different, so like A1 would be the pneumothorax labels, A2 are the chest tube labels. Uh, and so we, we use those to kind of create the, the correlations in the training data set. But um, my problem is that imagine that um, this correlation works for your training data if you are using Mimic, right? Because those are all like ICU patients, so this correlation holds. But for example, if you are now trying the same correlation or try to train a model that trained with that correlated data on another data set, which is not an ICU data set, which is still chest X-ray, but collected from somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. So this correlation may not hold, right? Probably those patients will not have chest tube, definitely. Right, right. Uh, yeah, no, uh, so, so, so you're exactly right. Uh, we create that data set and, uh, and it's just solely for the purpose of can your method uh, detect the correlation okay, okay and can your method detect for it but like uh it, it's a very controlled setting so like we're going to give you the train set and we're going to give you the test set uh, you, you know so, so like if if the train set if there's a correlation in the train set but not the test set then we're going to expect the degraded performance uh so we just want to we're just like semi-synthetically creating settings where you're going to get degraded performance and, and we're doing it semi-synthetically so we can go like a very large scale. Uh, so, so we can really test like, is your method gonna work? For example, uh, like does your method work only like when the correlation is very large or when the correlation is small? There's no way to kind of answer that question uh, using just natural data right now because it, it's gonna take time to, to find all those different settings. So like with such a framework, you can answer those questions um but by, by by having control over those variables um did that answer your question or i might have no 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 it answered the question so you asked whatever you are saying is just like you want to like give um whoever the user of the model is a kind of like um metric beforehand that what kind of subgroup the probably the model can work right or what kind of subgroup the model will not work, will have a degraded performance. Yeah, exactly. It's like providing also, yeah, the ground truth of like which subgroup is gonna be bad. And now like when, when we give you that, that ground truth, uh, you, you can test if your model is able to recover it or, or do better on, on that specifically. Because like existing data sets, it's like we found out about this like degraded performance like almost somehow like like uh, magically or or like like thankfully we found out about it but there might be so many others that we don't even know about so this is like giving us more control 
over what we know there's degraded performance in, uh, and then testing our methods against it. Okay, yeah. is there any other question? If not, let's thank Khaled for this uh, very interesting talk and let's give him a, a round of a virtual applause. Thank you so much, Khaled. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We will um, upload this uh, video to our YouTube channel later. And if you have further questions, please feel free to reach out or um, leave your questions under the YouTube video. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, guys. Bye.